Where did you get that? She asked in shock. Really? I show you a clear picture of you cheating on me, and the first thing you have to say is ask, Where did I get this? Does it matter where I got it? Well, my answer to your question changed the fact that you are cheating on me with it. I asked my wife of seven years. Honey, I know it looks bad, and I admit that we kissed, but it's not cheating. As you can see in the picture, we are in full view of many others. We weren't doing anything else. Of course, she replied. So that's your main defense? No explanation of who you're making out with or why you're making out like that. You're assuming that because you're not doing it with him in that picture on the dance floor, it's totally fine. I need to know, Tracy. Is that your definition of keeping your wedding vows? Brian, I can see that you're very upset about this. You have nothing to worry about, I swear. We were just caught off guard, and it happened. You don't have to worry about it. Making a big deal out of it won't help anything. She stated firmly. Innocent. Innocent? You still haven't even given me his name. Why should I get upset over someone I don't even know? I spat sarcastically. Does it matter what his name is? If I tell you, you might do something stupid. Like pick a fight, and he'll wipe the floor with you. I won't let that happen, she objected. I see. Thank you for your honesty and transparency. You've made your choice. Now I'll make mine, I replied hotly. I turned around, ran up the stairs and started packing my suitcase, which I would have enough for about a week. She quickly followed me. What are you doing? What does it look like? Packing a suitcase. But why? Because I can't take any more of your lies and deceit. I need to leave and think hard before I say or do something I might regret, I growled. Don't be silly, Brian. I know you wouldn't hit me for anything in the world until today. I knew there was no way in heck you cheat on me. So I guess we don't know each other as well as we thought we did. Cheating. Who said I cheated on you? shouted Tracy. Kissing him wasn't cheating and you know it. I never cheated on you. There he is, I said sarcastically. What is a blatant lie? But I've never cheated on you, Brian. I didn't cheat on you with him or anyone else, she shouted. Then what do you call it? And I held out another picture to her, taken that same night. That's a pretty good picture of you entertaining him, isn't it? But where? How? There you go again. Doesn't it matter where I got the picture from or how I came to it? Does that knowledge somehow change the fact that you really did cheat on me and just lied about it to my face? She dropped the pictures on the floor and sobbed, trying to hug her husband. Stay away from me, Tracy. Communication is a two-way street. I gave you a chance to be honest with me about everything and come clean. But you don't have to think I'm worthy of the truth. I could have stayed and tried to discuss this with you for the sake of our son, if you were honest. But you seem to be demanding too much from me. I'm taking my phone. If you ever call me again for any reason other than an emergency with little Bobby, I will block your number. Do I make myself clear? She nodded her head, and I walked out, pissed off, frustrated and hurt to the core. It was Friday night when I checked into the motel. I decided I would take the weekend to consider my next steps if I divorced her, which was my instinctive impulse. Bobby would end up in a single-parent household, and I would have to pay alimony and child support. I wish she had given me some sort of explanation, or at least apologized. Maybe she didn't have time to think about it. That's why I decided it would be better for us to be apart and think about what direction to take next. The absence of my wife and son was taking a heavy toll on me, and the loneliness was unbearable. I cried until I fainted shortly before noon the next day. Messages began to arrive. Having received my engineering degree some time ago, I had gotten a job at a local chemical laboratory, which was a packaging facility of a large chemical concern. After five years there, I was offered the position of production manager at the flagship research and development center 1,000 miles away. Along with the increased responsibility came a significant salary increase. So we jumped at the chance and moved. We left all our friends and family behind. Tracy got a job in the call center of a large credit card company. The call center employed over 1,200 people, most of whom were Tracy's age. A year after we moved in, little Bobby was born. I convinced her to become a stay-at-home mom since I was being paid well, but she loved the company of her work friends. Her work friends quickly became our friends. We were part of a loose group of 6 to 12 couples who got together on average every two months, sometimes at her home, 
more often at a restaurant or club. The girls were her co-workers, and the guys, like me, consisted of their husbands. That's not to say I didn't have friends where I worked, but Tracy works tirelessly to ensure that our social calendar consisted mostly of her co-workers. I had no objections, as they were all nice enough. The women were all stunningly attractive, as were their husbands. I felt out of place around the debonair and dapper men, but they all treated me the same as the others. It was from this group that my current barrage of messages consisted of. It was clear that Tracy had not only informed them of our problems, but had given them the details, and they were all urging me to give them an audience and help defuse the situation quickly. I shook my head, amazed at how she kept her attempt from me, yet freely shared the details with our friends. Now, I wondered what kind of friends they really were. I don't like other people knowing about my affairs, especially my personal life and the intimate details of my marriage. This situation in itself was disturbing to me. The only person who didn't call or text me was Tracy. She knew I would honor my promise to block her. Cassidy, it seemed to me, was the instigator of everything that was going on. She was Tracy's best friend, and they were in on it like thieves. She wanted me to meet the group at her house on Sunday night at 6 o'clock. My analytical mind guessed that this could be some kind of trap. My car might be blocked, or the guys might try to prevent my escape if I decided to leave the meeting earlier than they wished. I texted back that I would meet them at Angus Steakhouse Restaurant. I could park my car so that it wouldn't be blocked. And in the context of a public restaurant, I could leave whenever I wanted. Reluctantly, they granted my request. I agreed to the meeting for several reasons. First, to get answers as to why Tracy did what she did. Second, I wondered what our friends thought about the infidelity. Whose side would they be on? And third... I wondered if any of them were somehow involved in her adventures. Did they know? Had they set it up? If they did know about her extracurricular activities, none of them shared their concerns with me. I never backed down in the face of confrontation. As an account manager, I faced almost every possible challenge and know how to keep my cool in almost any environment. I looked forward to learning more so I could make an informed decision or put them on the spot. I left my car in the parking lot of a nearby store and walked over to the restaurant. I realized that the group had arrived much earlier than the agreed upon. Time to discuss strategy and prepare for the confrontation. This amused me. There was only one seat at the set table, and it was next to Tracy. She immediately rose to greet me as I approached. I stopped her before she could reach me. If you don't mind, I'd like to sit at the far end of the table, away from her, if you all don't mind. But if you don't mind, I can comfortably sit at the other table, I explained. Cassidy spoke quickly before Tracy could respond. Of course Brian is okay with that. Jared, how about giving Brian a seat at the end of the table? Please, Brian, have a seat. You're our guest tonight, so your dinner is already paid for. Why don't we all go ahead and order? Our group was in a separate dining area of the restaurant used for overflow. They must have taken care to shield it from prying eyes. Everyone quickly placed their orders, and that task was accomplished before I let Cassidy or anyone else take over the conversation. I was determined to get at least one answer before moving on. I handed out two copies of the photo of Tracy and the mystery man kissing on the dance floor. One on the left and one on the right, I began. You all seem very interested in Tracy and I settling our differences. I was shocked that she told our personal matters to someone before she and I even had a chance to discuss them on our own, but it just shows her continued disrespect for me and our marriage. Cassidy started to speak, but I interrupted her. Before any discussion begins, I want an answer. And right now, look closely at this picture. Do you see that man? She refuses to give his name. I'm sure at least one of you here knows who he is. You all say you want to help us solve our problems. Well, what I need help with most right now is information. If none of you can be honest with me and provide the facts as they are, then we have nothing more to discuss. There was a complete silence at the table. Even the talkative Cassidy hesitated to speak. Neither of them offered to say they didn't know the man, nor did they offer to tell me who he was. I had my own answer. Thank you for your time. I hope someone is really hungry and can eat my steak. I've just lost my appetite. 
No one here seems interested in helping us repair our relationship. I apologize. I got up from the table and left. Tracy called out after me, begging me to come back, but no one else did. It was obvious that our friends were your friends, not mine. Tracy, Cassidy, and the rest of the group were stunned. They had planned to have a reasonable discussion with me, but I had blindsided the entire meeting with my stubborn demand. It would take some serious strategy to get through to me, and they weren't ready for that at the moment. I didn't mention it at the restaurant, but I was on my way out of the motel. I stopped at a fast food joint and grabbed a bite to eat. When I got home, I talked to the babysitter Tracy had hired for the evening, paid her, and thanked her for her services. I then gulped down my food and began to quickly move my clothes and personal belongings into the spare bedroom. I had already been to the local hardware store over the weekend and bought a pair of locks with identical keys, similar to the ones on our front and back doors. I installed them on the spare bedroom door and the hall bathroom door, keeping only the keys for myself. Not to avoid a verbal altercation with Tracy, but so she wouldn't try to physically seduce me in the shower or in the middle of the night when I was asleep. Once settled in the house, I happily played with my three-year-old son, who was the light of my life, before bathing him and putting him down for the night. Tracy must have realized I was home because my car was in the garage when she pulled up to the house at quarter past ten p.m. They must have had a real brainstorming session. Either she was with her lover again, and I had no idea which one was true. As sad as that sounds. She excitedly ran upstairs, happy to see me back, and found me in Bobby's room, sitting in a chair watching my son sleeping peacefully, tears streaming down my face. I shushed her and waved her off before she entered the room. No need to disturb his innocent slumber. After I quietly closed the door, she tried to hug me, but I prevented her, unable to bear it. She spread a smile from ear to ear. I'm so glad you're back home where you belong. Let me make you something to eat. We have a lot to talk about. I've already eaten, but thanks for the offer. So where have you been all this time? Entertaining your lover again? Hinted. I know I just left the steakhouse. They can confirm that they helped me find the right words to get us back on track. I have so much to tell you, she explained. I'll talk to you about anything if you give me the name of your lover. If you can't do that, then we have nothing to talk about. I can't. I just can't, she said sullenly. I wish you would keep to me your husband, at least half the devotion you keep to your lover. I will stay in the spare bedroom until further notice. Please stay away from me and never touch me. Who knows what disgusting diseases you now carry inside you. But I won't let your horrors keep me away from my son. He needs me as much as you do. If you ever decide you're ready to talk, your next words to me will be the name of your lover. But if you're willing to sacrifice our marriage to protect him, then so be it. However, I don't want you to speak another word to me until you are ready to give up your lover's name. For all I know, you're going behind my back, preparing to take our son and move in with him tomorrow. She walked away, sobbing and lowering her head. A week went by during which Tracy and I enjoyed talking to Bobby, but unfortunately, we didn't say a word to each other. Finally, on Monday night after work, upon returning home, I was faced with a surprise. Everything was fine before I entered the house, but apparently they wanted to surprise me. As I walked into the kitchen to see what we were having for dinner, a crowd of people piled in from the adjoining rooms and surrounded me. It was a group of Tracy's couple friends. They all seemed to be here, and they couldn't wait to see me again. Nothing was said that would cause annoyance, but I felt like they were walking on eggshells. The first words out of my mouth were, Where's Bobby? I decided that adult conversations should not take place around my son. I've already dropped him off at the babysitter's, and she's made arrangements for him to stay the night, Tracy explained. I see, I said in surprise. There had been some pre-planning that I hadn't been privy to, but I didn't see any of your cars parked on the street. We all wanted to surprise you, Brian, so we all parked a block away from the house and walked. We couldn't risk you just driving by after seeing all of our cars. Cassidy objected. Well, you all certainly caught me off guard. What's the matter? Why are you all here? Has something changed recently that I don't know about? I inquired. Yes, honey, Tracy began. Why don't we all go into the living room and explain everything? I'm ready to answer your question right now. 
Sure. But first I need to go to the bathroom for a minute. I just got home. I'll be right there. Why don't you all go ahead? I went to the restroom in the hallway, peed, flushed, and washed my hands. Turning on the recording on my cell phone, I slipped it into my shirt pocket, where the camera lens was barely visible, in case anything interesting happened, and joined the crowd in the living room. I was surprised to see two other people there who hadn't been in the kitchen before. I immediately recognized the butthole Tracy was cheating with, sitting next to a pretty woman slightly younger than him. Tracy began, Brian, you've already met everyone except Elliot Franklin and his wife Gail. They've been part of our company of friends for a long time, but you've never met them before. I realize this may come as a shock to you, but you were so insistent on finding out who he was that we all consulted and decided this was the best way to find out his name. If you try to attack him, all the guys here have agreed to come between you. We don't want anyone to get hurt today. So you finally gave me a face. It's a little late to worry about me getting hurt, isn't it? I stated sarcastically. Oh, I get it. Neither of you were worried for a second about hurting me, were you? All you cared about was keeping the boy wonder safe and sound, didn't you? Don't worry. I'm not going to touch that jerk. I don't want to catch any of the diseases. He may have already infected Tracy with everyone present, let out a groan of disappointment. Cassidy jumped in. Brian, we understand your frustration. Can we speak calmly and professionally as friends while this situation is being handled? We are trying to give you what you asked for. You wanted his name, and now you have it. We assumed you would also want to talk to him, and as you can see, we have already arranged that. However, Elliot doesn't need me to speak for him or on his behalf. He is perfectly capable of speaking for himself. Our role today is merely to introduce you to each other. After the introductions, Elliot rose to his feet and held out his hand. I'm afraid we've gotten off to a bad start. I hope that by the end of this meeting we can be friends or at least polite to each other. I promise to always treat you with respect and courtesy, and I hope you will do the same. Brian. May I call you Brian? He asked, extending his hand to me. I made no movement in response to his gesture, keeping my hands at my side. First of all, since we're just now meeting for the first time, Mr. Franklin, I prefer you call me Mr. Wilson. I can't imagine that our friendly relationship would warrant such familiarity. Secondly, you have just promised to treat me with respect and courtesy after you have already shown me blatant disrespect. And yet, I am supposed to flippantly ignore your extreme insolence and treat you politely in return? Fair enough, Mr. Wilson. My suggestion was solely in reference to our conversation today. I was not referring to past incidents or incidents. If you will allow me, I would like to talk to you about what happened between me and Tracy. Your wife. Please do not say her name in my presence or refer to her as my wife. That title may be short-lived and unpleasant for me. I am evaluating the pros and cons of divorce, which I am sure you are already aware of. How should I address her then, Mr. Wilson? You may refer to her as the woman I married, and for the moment, I will accept that. Very well, Mr. Wilson. I would like to tell you what happened between the woman you married and me. I hope I can put the circumstances in a light that you will find acceptable. I am all yours, Mr. Franklin. Please enlighten me, I asked. The arrogant man took a deep breath and began to make his point. Look around this room, Mr. Wilson. What do you see? I'll tell you what you see. You see a room full of exceptionally attractive women and men, including the woman you married and yourself. Do you think that's a coincidence? Doesn't it strike you that your best friends are a group you've enjoyed socializing with countless times? Turn out to be far more attractive than the average man or woman you meet? This group inevitably came together like birds of a feather. As the friendships grew, so did the intimacy and expressions of friendship. Every person in this room is in a happy, stable, and committed relationship. That is our first and foremost goal. When each person is confident in their relationship with their soulmate, we will realize that no forces on earth can separate us from each other. And every one of us here believes the same about you and the woman you married. He continued, Take my wife here, Gail. She is as great to me as any woman in this room, and we plan to spend the rest of our lives together. No man in this room, including you, will ever be able to take her away from me. 
and that knowledge gives me the confidence to share her with others for our good and the good of others in our group. We both learn and grow more than we could by remaining monogamous. It's an outdated and archaic term that no longer binds people together the way true love does, consisting of trust, intimacy, understanding, sharing, and opening horizons to great and beautiful things in our marriage. How nice for you and your wife, Mr. Franklin, and the rest of this group, if they are all free to do this with each other without restriction. But that has nothing to do with me and the woman I married. Excuse me, Mr. Wilson, but didn't you just admit that you have less trust, understanding, and security in your relationship with the woman you married than every other couple in this room? Don't you see the tremendous benefit you both could derive and expand your relationship by opening yourselves up to that? And he spread his arms wide, as if embracing everyone in the room. If what you say is true, Mr. Franklin, then you just called every woman in the room a cheater, including the one I married. I am appalled that you so easily flummoxed and changed the morals of the woman I married. I find your actions regrettable and reprehensible. A gentleman never interferes in marital relations, as you have done. I see where your flawed logic leads you, Mr. Wilson. Rest assured, this is not a one-sided approach. You, too, are being asked to embrace the concepts we all hold dear here. You could be with any woman in this room right now, if you so desired. When you and the woman you married became part of our group, it was inevitable that you would be invited to participate with us in every way, inclusively. If you hadn't told her off so harshly that evening, she had planned to broach the subject with you and discuss the potential benefits. She felt this experience could bring. Mr. Wilson, the woman you married, said you jumped on her with accusations before she had a chance to fully explain to you what it was all about. She panicked and retreated in defense, not knowing how to salvage a conversation with you and the adversarial atmosphere you presented to her. I am sure you will agree with everything we suggest as being beneficial to you and the woman you married. All that remains is to find a way that will make you feel more comfortable. I see, I said, as if seriously considering everything he'd said. Then I looked Tracy straight in the eye and asked, Is all this true? You discussed all this with them without my knowledge, and then agreed to test the waters with Mr. Franklin to see if it was beneficial to us as husband and wife, without even discussing it with me beforehand. Tracy nodded nervously before explaining, I've been told how wonderful it is to have such loose associations, and how it improves and strengthens their marriages, and I wanted us to have the same by participating in the experience with Elliot. I was evaluating the whole experience to see how it could improve our relationship. Honey, please believe that my love for you has never waned, and I only wanted to show you what I learned from him, to convince you that participating in the experience would be good for both of us. She smiled sweetly, realizing that this was the first real conversation I'd let her have with me since that night. So you want me to believe that just one wonderful session with a super stud instilled in you the skills of an experienced prostitute? After all, it wasn't your first time with him, was it? She lowered her gaze to her feet, unable to make eye contact, confirming my suspicions. Mr. Franklin jumped up again. Don't you see, Mr. Wilson? We were able to help the woman who married you understand the benefits. You will also be able to participate in every way. Plus, there are other advantages you may not have even considered, he added. I see. So you imagine yourself to be some sort of Casanova, Mr. Wilson? I am a very experienced and attentive lover, and I am adept at taking less experienced lovers, such as the woman you married under my tutelage. Through my experience, she will blossom, grow, and learn, and you will benefit from her new experience as well. Time spent with me and others will broaden her horizons. Please don't get defensive when I explain this to you. Everyone goes through periods in life when we become complacent and fall into a routine. I looked Tracy straight in the eye again. When have I ever resisted trying something new? If you think we need to brighten up our relationship, why didn't you ever talk to me about it before jumping into bed with a womanizer? She timidly replied, Please don't misunderstand me, honey. You're such a gentle and sweet lover, and that's what I need most of the time. But sometimes I want things to be more forceful and direct. That's exactly what Elliot showed me. He in no way tried to replace you in my heart. 
He's your physical opposite. All I could do was keep myself from lashing out at the guy and trying to destroy him. If I allowed the thought that Tracy and I could repair our relationship and make it work for my son, it was forever lost. A hurricane raged inside me, pounding relentlessly in my chest. Outwardly, however, I appeared calm and unperturbed. Now that I had come to the irreversible conclusion to divorce her, my new imperative was to gather as much ammunition as possible to return fire on all of them, creating as much chaos in their lives as possible. For their part, in the destruction of my happy home. Thank you, Brian. Now, do you see our group in a better light? Will you and Tracy join? You will never regret it. Your marriage will only grow stronger from it. I guarantee it. As much as it pains me to say it literally, I grinned. I'd like a little more time to digest everything that's been explained to me today. Tracy and I need to discuss something, one-on-one -on -one alone, just between the two of us. Once we get something settled, We'll get back to you with an answer. Is that okay with you? The butthole grinned in an obvious weak smile. He was having trouble pretending to be polite. He hadn't expected a delay. He needed my answer right now, but he wasn't going to get it. Sure, he said obediently. Take as much time as you need. Then he nodded. Gentlemen, the three largest men quickly grabbed me and held me tight. I wasn't going anywhere, although I was held securely. I didn't feel threatened in any way. It was just a surprise move. Tracy walked over, pulled my cell phone out of my shirt pocket, and started clicking all the videos she had taken. Please understand, Brian. We want to trust you. We really do. But until you become one of us, we must understandably take steps to protect ourselves. It was quite obvious that you were recording the events of this evening on your cell phone. I'm afraid we can't afford that level of trust in you at this time. Tracy nodded toward the butthole. He asked her, So it's all gone then? Everything. Tracy nodded, saying yes. There will be no recording of tonight. She then tucked her phone away in her pocket. It became a abundantly clear that she was already a full-fledged member of the club, for him to believe that she would go against my wishes to fulfill them. I demonstrated the look of defeat this jerk was seeking. Mr. Franklin continued, There you go, Brian. Don't be so depressed. I'd like to believe that you've decided to keep a record primarily to better choose who you're going to be with first, when you join our summit group. But please realize that we simply can't take that risk. There's too much at stake. He patted me on the back, and the group quietly and quietly left the house. I grabbed my keys and headed to the garage myself. Where are you going? asked Tracy, puzzled to pick up Bobby. If that's okay, I replied. I was hoping we could, you know, renew our physical acquaintance today. There's no reason to go get him right now, is there? I miss my son. Obviously you don't. I'll be back in a little while, I advised. She took another hint, but I ignored her and walked out the door. I drove to the Angus Steakhouse restaurant. I was hungry since I hadn't had dinner yet, and I was missing something I ordered but didn't eat the last time I was there. The restaurant did not disappoint. Taking my time, I savored the tender beef mentally going over the events of tonight. Hopefully, everything would work out the way I had planned. Only time would tell. The kind. Mrs. Stevenson thanked me for the generous tip I'd paid her over and above her usual hourly rate. I might have to depend on her in the near future, and I wanted to make an acquaintance with her, in addition to Tracy. Bobby was thrilled to meet Daddy, and he couldn't stop cackling all the way home. I gave him a bath and fed him before putting him down for the night. Tracy informed me that she was cooking something light for us since we hadn't eaten. I informed her that I had already had a snack and she should take care of herself and not worry about me. Offended by my pettiness, she brushed me off, not wanting to upset Bobby with the upcoming conversation. Since it was Monday night and we both had to work tomorrow, I got ready for bed. She wanted to talk. What's going on, Brian? You seemed really interested in Elliot's offer about our band, and then you dropped me like a hot potato. What happened? I'm really glad you asked. Let me answer your question with my own questions. Perhaps your answers will provide clarity. I offered. Go ahead, she suggested. Just before they left, three men seized me in my own house, and you never said a word against it. Is that true? It wasn't like that, she objected. It wasn't like that, was it? 
Three men grabbed and held me in my own home. Yes or no? Tracy? Did it happen? Yes. But before she could answer, I interrupted her. Yes, it did. And did you say a word of protest to any of the other witnesses who were also silent? Yes or no? Tracy? Just answer yes or no, I commanded. No, she answered with difficulty. Finally, we are beginning to understand. Then listen carefully to the next question. Did I ask you to take my cell phone and delete anything from it? Did you? Yes or no? Tracy? Come on, girl. You were doing so well. Don't stop. Be honest, I muttered. No, she said quietly. So please bear with me, because this is going to be a long question. Be careful so I don't have to repeat myself. You admit that you had no objection to me being held in custody in my own home. You also admit that you took my cell phone and deleted the recordings from it. Not at my request, but at the request of someone other than your husband. Is that true, Tracy? Yes or no? Is that true? Yes. Good girl. We're almost there now. Since I was standing right in the room when this happened, and did not hear anyone tell you or ask you to delete anything from my personal phone, you must have tentatively entered into the conversation in my absence, then agreed to perform this task without my prior knowledge or consent. Is that correct? Tracy looked down at her feet. Yes, that's correct. I hadn't thought of it that way. You make it seem like a betrayal on my part. It is betrayal, Tracy. Now let's go back to your first two questions. Why did I drop you like a hot potato? Why? Your own answer should reveal the truth about why I acted that way. You proved today that you are on their side, not mine, not ours, but theirs. Now if you have no objections, I'm going to bed alone again tonight. I don't want to watch and be around a man who so indifferently stabs me in the back. Tracy started sobbing as I left her in the hallway to contemplate her behavior. Of course, I locked the door. Sometime around four in the morning, I heard attempts to open the door. Three or four fruitless turns were enough to foil her attempt. Tuesday morning, I was talking to the vice president in charge of the facility where I worked. Dan, could you recommend a divorce attorney for me? I mean, a good one. One that will fight as hard for the husband as he will for the wife. Please tell me you're not asking for one for yourself, Brian, Dan pleaded. Unfortunately, I am. I assumed a man of your position should be aware of such matters. You seem to know the rest. I grinned. I'm good friends with Ted. Russ. He's our contact with the firm that handles all of our legal matters. I'm sure he can give you the name of a good man. Let me give him a quick call and get back to you right away. Thanks, Dan. And no need to talk, Brian. This will remain just between you and me. I respect the other person's personal space. You don't know how good that feels to hear. Thank you, Dan. On Ted's recommendation, I called B. Thornton's office and set up an appointment for 2.30 that afternoon. It turned out that it was not the letter B, but B, that is Beatrice. She informed me that her caseload was 70% women and 30% men. But as soon as she agreed to take on a case, she took it on immediately and fought hard for her client. Despite the formidable circumstances, it didn't take me long to convince her of the validity of my position as an injured party, and she was happy to take me on. She warned me that I would be paying child support for 15 years until Bobby turned 18. But college expenses are usually factored into these cases for the benefit of the child. I explained that I had no problem providing for my son, but I was hoping for at least 50-50 joint custody either once a week or every other month. She can't promise anything, but will fight hard to get those terms. As for child support, she said I would likely be on the hook for three to five years, depending on which judge we get because of the income disparity. The general result in this state was one year of alimony for every two years of marriage, up to 20 years of marriage. Thereafter, it was limited to 10 years, although I would have to put up with it. The thought of paying her to have fun with idiots pissed me off, expecting our family to grow. Tracy and I rented the house we'd lived in for the past four years and diligently studied house plans and vacant lots on which to build our dream home. I had accumulated quite a few sketches depicting the elements that were to be part of our special retreat. Now, all those dreams were nothing more than smoke. At least the house didn't have to be sold, divided, or fought over. Bobby, 
at his tender age, wouldn't be attached to any particular dwelling. So if Tracy continued to rent the house, it wouldn't matter to me. I knew I'd never sleep in the master bedroom again, knowing it had been contaminated by that butthole. Who knows how many times he had already managed to christen the bed with her before I discovered her infidelity. B explained that the average divorce in our state is eight months, if uncontested, and a year, if contested. I was really hoping I would fall into the eight-month number. Being bound in the bonds of marriage to a traitorous cheater held little appeal for me, now that my decision to divorce Tracy was clear. B also explained that there was no financial benefit to filing a declaration of infidelity, but she said that a declaration could be helpful if there was a disagreement over custody. She stated that she could have the paperwork ready for service as early as Thursday afternoon. I asked her to have Tracy serve the papers at work on Friday at 10 a.m., where many of her friends and colleagues could witness the event after the divorce issues had been resolved and a fee agreed. I asked her about possible living arrangements until the divorce was finalized. What questions do you have, Brian? My only concern is time with my son in this early formative period of his life. Eight months to a year can seem like an eternity to both him and me. I don't want to be an absent father to him any more than necessary. Would it not be illegal or inappropriate for me to continue living in the same house with her, to maximize my time with him? While that's not uncommon, Brian, it can be quite a challenge. How so? First of all, when she is served with the divorce papers on Friday, she will be extremely unhappy with you. If you are in close proximity to her home, she will likely rain, fire, and brimstone down on your head. Are you prepared to face the woman's wrath? Absolutely. I'll be able to easily share my emotions when she gets a summons, because in my mind, we'll be legally separated, and I'll be able to treat her indifferently as she's been treating me lately. And that brings me to my next point, Brian. She may well not want a divorce. Very often, cheating wives want to have their cake and eat it too, letting you go. May be an impossible task for her, and she may do everything she can to prevent it. But this is a legal process, right? She can't bend the law to her will just because she feels like it. You're right, of course, but she could make a mess of things. Be informed her. How so? If you enter into a conjugal relationship at any point before the divorce, the time limit will reset to zero, and the clock will start ticking from a new beginning. And you'll have to wait another eight months, she said. The state will view your marital relationship as your desire to end the divorce process. That will never be a problem for me, although I can easily envision Tracy trying to lure me into her bed to disrupt the process. I have an iron. Will be. I won't give in, I said firmly. You don't have to, she insisted. All Tracy has to do is claim that you had an affair, and unless you can prove otherwise, which is virtually impossible, the clock will be turned over whether you were married or not. The judge will have a hard time believing your claim that you were never intimate with her, yet you live together under the same roof. I've seen it happen before. Brian and I strongly advise against it, I countered. Let me ask you this. If she does make such a statement, would she have to give specific details such as time, place, etc.? I don't mean intimate details of the hypothetical session itself, but dates and times that I could refute. Yes, yes, she wants to. But again, it would be your word against hers, and the judge would likely believe her, especially if she was tearfully persuasive. Leave it to me. Thank you, B. You've been a great help to me. I then talked to her about another legal issue I would have to deal with immediately after the divorce. Tracy usually gets home a half hour earlier than I do, so it was no surprise to find her cooking dinner in the kitchen. Contrary to my custom, I avoided the kitchen and headed upstairs to take a shower. Since I started using the hall bathroom, she had fewer opportunities to trap me. I took a change of clothes with me to the bathroom. It was time to start practicing living separately under the same roof. When I emerged from the bathroom fully dressed, she was waiting for me in the hall. Dinner will be ready in a few minutes. Bobby is already sitting in his high chair in the kitchen. You smell nice and fresh, she said, coquettishly. I'll be right down. Thanks. I replied, ignoring her remark and unlocking my spare bedroom door. The tension was palpable, but she didn't say anything sarcastic. As we ate, she began. I'd like to explain that we made a cell phone deal last night. 
Knock yourself out, I said calmly. While you were downstairs evaluating potential partners, and the three of us were alone upstairs. Elliot informed me that he knew you were recording the events of that evening, and that it would not be fair to let everyone be exposed to the professional risk. You could expose the group too, with the video. The right thing to do would be to eliminate the threat. He said they couldn't leave there that night until the threat was neutralized. Not knowing if you had the password on your phone, they were willing to take it with them and return it later when it was cleared. Elliot suggested that I could prevent all of this by deleting the records myself. In your presence. I see. And why did they believe you were capable of such a thing towards your husband? Because I gave them my word, Brian. I don't understand. Understand what? Didn't you give me your word to be faithful to me on our wedding day? There was silence after my remark. I was glad for it. Darling, I don't want you to think that I'm on their side. That's not the case at all. It isn't. What if the circumstances had been different? What if those three men had grabbed you in our house? Do you think I would have just stood by silently and let them do it? What other choice did you have, Brian? The three of them could have easily taken you silly. That's true. But that knowledge wouldn't have stopped me. Heck, it wouldn't even have slowed me down. I might have been defeated, but only after I'd done a lot of damage myself. I would have fought for you because I would have been on your side, not theirs. We were a team, you and I. Last night you didn't act like my wife. You acted like one of them. I'm sorry. You don't understand me, Brian. I explained about the cell phone. I don't know what else to say. There's nothing more to say, is there? I joked about that subject. You're right. How did you find those pictures, Brian? I'd like to know. I'm sure you would. Wouldn't it be interesting if one of your friends turned out to be not as dedicated to your cause as the other members of your group? What if one of your co-workers turned you into me and delivered those pictures to my office? How would you feel about that? Who? Please tell me. Who? A man or a woman? She asked urgently. I can't tell you, Tracy. Why not? I gave my word. I said with a wide grin. I could see she wasn't getting anywhere with her questions, so she decided to broach another topic. Did you enjoy watching? No, I just saw a bunch of animals. That's exactly right, Brian. It doesn't have to be emotional for any of them. It will just strengthen our marriage. How did it go? Our marriage is hanging by a thread. I already feel closer to you, I added sarcastically. Don't be like that. You don't know what it's like, Tracy. Has our life become so boring, mundane, and devoid of fantasy that you're afraid we can't survive as a couple without inviting other people into the bedroom? I didn't say that. It's not that we couldn't survive without it. But don't you want to do more than just survive? Shouldn't we take opportunities to strengthen our marriage when they come along? What's the harm in that? The harm, as I see it, is the destruction of the trust we once had. That is what you have already done with your experiments. Instead of strengthening our marriage, it is tearing the very fabric of it in two. Perhaps no one you know considers fidelity an admirable character trait, but I do. Obviously, your friends don't give it much thought. They proved that last night. I don't trust you anymore, Tracy. You've proven you're perfectly capable of doing whatever you want behind my back. If it's so important to you, and you believe in it so much, why didn't you come to me and talk things over with me before you jumped into bed with another man? because I knew you would react that way. I thought that if I could participate and realize the benefits of it first, then I could bring everything I've learned to you, and we'd be better for it. When you see the improvements in me, I thought you would realize the value of it and agree with me wholeheartedly. So you and this smug butthole consider yourselves supreme and enlightenment and understanding, believing that lowlifes like me should be spoon-fed to slowly comprehend the life truths you both somehow instinctively grasp. How elitist of you to graciously allow your superior knowledge to trickle down to this lowly peasant. I didn't realize how lucky I was. Sarcasm was in my every word now, and she caught it. She said, why don't you let me show you what I've learned? I've adopted some techniques from Elliot and watched Gail closely last night as you asked. The purpose of this whole process is to improve our love life, not destroy it. Let me show you what I can do right now. I swear you won't regret it, she enthused. Every time I look at you, I cringe. 
It's not conducive to me wanting to kiss you anytime soon. All you're going to offer me is a cheater who freely shares with other men what used to belong only to me. Only yours. You don't own me, Brian, and I never have and never will, she said defiantly. You're absolutely right. I never claimed to own you. I mistakenly assumed you were mine because you said you gave yourself to me, and now you've taken your words back and given them to another man. You've broken something in me, Tracy, and I'm not sure it can be fixed. She started sobbing again. Needless to say, that was the last conversation I had with her until Friday. All of my free time was spent with Bobby. I didn't hesitate to change his diaper, and never once asked her to help me with him. We were almost playing a game of who bathed him the most. Bobby seemed to enjoy the constant attention, and I was happy about it too. Over the next few days, I researched the names of Elliot and Gail Franklin. I hoped to find their connection to the group, but I came up almost empty-handed in public records. I found one Elliot Franklin, a homeless man who had been arrested for soliciting people for money downtown. The photo and age didn't even come close to the one who had entertained Tracy. I'll try to find out more about them. I decided to have Tracy over at 10 a.m. on Friday morning because I was attending a meeting of the local chapter of facilities managers. We usually meet every quarter for two four hours, including lunch. Numerous contractors sponsor this event to advertise their services at the various facilities represented by members. Thus, not if, but when Tracy calls. My secretary will confirm my extended absence, and I will intentionally leave my cell phone on silent mode. The only call I answered would be an emergency call requiring my attention at work. I wasn't avoiding Tracy at all. I just wanted to give her time to get over the initial shock before talking to her. When I eventually returned to work, I took her call, leaving numerous messages. I could hear her quickly moving out of sight as she started talking to me. It's about darn time. Are you serious? To get serviced in front of my friends? Do you know how embarrassed I was? Are you really going to divorce me over this? I told you it was nothing, Brian. When are you going to get that through your thick skull? Why won't you return my calls? Why do you refuse to talk to me about this? My secretary should have informed you that I'm in a management meeting. I just got back to the office and called you back right away. I have a job to do. You know, it doesn't stop just because you want to talk. And as for talking, when have I ever refused to talk to you? You're the one who's been avoiding talking to me for the last two days. I've never once refused to talk to you. I'm still talking to you now, aren't I? But since we both have work to do, why don't we resume this conversation at a more appropriate time after work? Then I will talk to you about anything you wish. She began to cry over the phone. I don't want a divorce, she wailed. Please, Brian, don't divorce me. We'll talk tonight, okay? Tracy. Okay, she said, snorting. I love you tonight, then. Goodbye. Tracy. I only had one meeting left at work that day, and it was a short one concerning a lab that was having problems. I called our building automation contractor to resolve the problem. Surrounding yourself with quality people makes the job much easier. I arrived an hour early, as Friday afternoons tend to have fewer problems. Most people don't want to solve problems on a Friday afternoon. However, I realized that I would have to solve the problem, and the best way to do that is to pull myself together and face it head on. Realizing that she might not be in the mood to cook tonight, I grabbed some Chick-fil-A for dinner and texted her. She arrived shortly after I did. I grabbed his diaper bag and carried Bobby into the house from her car. She rushed to me, hugging me as I held our boy in my arms, knowing I wouldn't harshly rebuke her or upset Bobby. I set him in his high chair and helped feed him. Babies can be sloppy eaters, of course. He is at the stage where he likes to throw food, so there is very little food left on his tray for him to throw. She thanked me for the takeout food. We both cooed and talked happily with Bobby, although tears were streaming from her eyes at the same time. I spent most of the evening with him, never leaving his side until he was put down for the night again. He was my center of attention, my goal, my reason for enduring the dire circumstances. I knew what was in store for me, and I was as prepared for it as I could be. She was going through the divorce papers when I walked into the living room where she was located. She took a deep breath to calm herself before she spoke. I'm sorry, Brian. Okay, is that what you wanted to hear? 
To be honest, it's the first apology you've given me since this whole thing came up. What exactly are you apologizing for, Tracy? I'm sorry that you saw those pictures and found out about them the way you did. I can only imagine how uncomfortable it must have been for you. I see you're sorry I found out, but not sorry you cheated on me. I see. Don't say that. Elliot said that once you realized the benefits of our association, you would come around and accept our group on an intimate level, because you would be given the freedom to be with other women. Just as I am with other men. Naturally, that's what he said. It seems you and Elliot both suffer from the same mistake of not consulting me on matters such as infidelity. It's a shame you trust his words about my character more than mine. Contrary to popular belief, Elliot is not a keeper of information about me or our marriage. He may be an expert on many things, but as far as knowing me is concerned, he's a failure. Just as you are, apparently. Look, darling, I realize now that I acted wrongly. You're right. I should have talked to you first before getting involved without your knowledge. After seeing your reaction that night, Elliot told me that in hindsight, if I had approached you first, things would have gone much more smoothly. He's still convinced you'll come around, but now I'm not so sure. Why don't you call off this stupid divorce and let us get back to normal? Back on the road again, Tracy. That train has derailed and done irreparable damage. There's no getting it back on the tracks. You blew it up with dynamite when you let that butthole take you to bed. And then you betrayed me as well. Just sign the papers and let us both pick up what's left of our lives and go our separate ways. I know you, Brian. You don't want Bobby to end up in a single-parent family, to be raised by two parents living in separate homes. If I remarried, you wouldn't want him calling another man daddy. No man wants that for his son. Think about it. Reconciliation is the best option for both of us. I wouldn't want him to call another woman mom if you remarry after a divorce like you did. That's probably true. You should have thought about all this before you betrayed your vows, not after. You're right. It would have killed me to hear him call another man. Daddy. But it's better to come from a broken home than to live in a house full of lies and deceit. If we hadn't gotten divorced, I still wouldn't be part of your company of whores and harlots. They may be physically attractive, but to me, they are disgusting. And you would continue to entertain whomever you saw fit. But it will never be me. I can never be intimate with you again, Tracy. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. That's not what you mean. You're just saying that to hurt me, and it really hurts. So one point, Brian. Look, what if I gave up on the idea? Completely swore I'd never get involved in their relationship again. What if I turned my back on them as friends? I'm desperate. Honey, you and Bobby are two of the best things that have happened to me in my entire life. I'm sorry you think I've turned my back on us, but it's not true. I value you two above anything else in the world. I hear the words you say, Tracy, but I just don't believe you. You've already proven yourself to be a liar. Now I can't trust a word you say. It's too late. Just sign the papers and get this over with as soon as possible. Never. I'll never sign those darn papers as long as I live. I don't want a divorce, and I will fight you every step of the way, no matter how long it takes. I may have lost you at this point, Brian, but I want you back. I'm not going to give up. I believe in us more than you do. I'll crawl to you on my hands and knees until you take me back. Too bad you didn't have enough faith in us to stay true to your wedding vows. You've heard the old aphorism. Once cheated, always cheated. And it is through that prism that I will always look at you. I quipped. She started sobbing again, perhaps from the realization that she was facing an impossible task. What now? she asked. I hope you don't expect me to leave. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here with Bobby. Besides, we have nowhere else to go. She mumbled. You're right. Now that you're out of the world, Bobby has become my whole world to me. I don't want to spend any more time away from him than necessary. That's why I've decided to continue living here while the divorce is going through. I continued. Don't worry. I won't get in your way. I will no longer require you to do my laundry, cook my meals, or clean up after me. You take care of your needs. I'll take care of mine, and we'll both take care of Bobby's needs. All I ask is that you don't touch me with your contaminated body. To me, you are a walking contagion from head to toe. You are disgusting to look at, disgusting to think about, 
impossible to stay married to. We will coexist under the same roof, but it will only be coexistence until divorce, which will never lead to reconciliation. As she pondered my words, her elation was replaced by dejection. I heard what you said, Brian, but divorce is a long road, and we both know a lot can happen in that time. I'm going to get you back, honey. I swear I will. As long as you keep meeting and hanging out with your so-called friends, you won't have a chance in heck. I will never socialize with them again. As you so aptly pointed out, I don't own you, and I can't control your behavior. But if you ever bring one of your jerk lovers here, I swear on my life that you and he will seriously regret it. Is that clear? Of course. Sweetheart, I already told you. I'll turn my back on them if that's what it takes to get you back. Do you want me to quit my job and become a full-time mom? No, it's too late for that now. Besides, if you did that, I'd only be paying more in child support in the divorce. She didn't like my return, but she kept a cheerful smile for my benefit. I decided that the days of our confrontation were behind us. There was nothing she could say now that would make me lose my temper and berate her again. We'd both had enough of insults and innuendo. I could be professional, both at work and at home. I decided to treat this as a temporary business arrangement. Nothing was going to stop me from spending time with my son. For a few weeks we communicated politely, saying only what was necessary. Surprisingly, we agreed to several suggestions from my attorney B in the interim. I would pay all rent if Tracy would pay all utilities. I canceled all utilities in our joint names and reissued them in her name only. Both of our cars were already paid off, so we each paid our own gas and insurance. We each took care of our own meals, so there was no need to share groceries. Being financially free of it was not as difficult as I had anticipated, since I was still paying the lion's share of our expenses. She accepted it. I transferred half of our savings to a new account, opened in my name only, and left the balance in an account in her name. She was quite unpleasant to me for a few days after that, but soon realized that I was only enforcing the terms of the divorce agreement which she politely refused to sign anyway. Tracy made every effort to come up with an excuse to ask me questions and engage me in conversation. I was always polite and never turned her down unless she got personal. I never asked her for anything or started conversations. One day, I was going through a desk drawer in my room, looking for socks of a certain color, and it occurred to me that I hadn't seen the three pictures of their meeting. I urgently searched all the drawers in case I had moved them and forgotten about it. They weren't there, and I knew who had taken them. I scrutinized the lock on my door with a magnifying glass, and only then noticed the fine scratches. She would never have been able to pick the lock on her own. She must have called a locksmith to do it for her and produce a key. That was the only explanation. The next day, I bought two new identical locks and installed them on the bedroom and bathroom doors and hid the only new keys back in my pocket. She didn't want me to know that she could get into my room any time she wanted, and I didn't want her to know that she no longer had access until she tried again. Her continued betrayal to protect her lover further confirmed that my decision to divorce was the right one. Now, I wondered if she would lie and claim that her date with Elliot never happened. After a few months of detente, she began periodic asking me to take her out to eat or to go to a movie, in general, to anything resembling a date or a couple's activity. I always politely declined such offers. I could see that she was getting nervous. She was used to going out with her friends a few times a month. She really wanted to be with them again, but she remembered her promise not to socialize with them. Then I started receiving calls and messages from them, inviting me to go out or even stay alone if I wanted to. After each such call or message, I blocked the number without answering it to prevent a repeat. In mid-December, she invited me to attend a Christmas party in her company. I politely declined, citing that I had promised to babysit a little boy, but told her to have a good time. We had always gone there together in the past. The following weekend was my company's party. I had planned to go alone, but she didn't want to do it. In the evening, she took Bobby to the babysitter's house. I cleverly left for the party without saying a word to her. Apparently, she soon followed me in her car and quickly found me at the party. As usual, 
She was stunningly beautiful. She tried to make small talk with me in the presence of others, but I had little interaction with her when I was alone with him. Vice President Dan asked if we had made up. I explained the situation, and he only laughed, saying that I had the courage to live under such circumstances. However, I made it clear that I didn't want to waste time with my son for this time. He understood my position. Leaving the party, I went straight to the babysitter's house and picked up Bobby. He slept all the way home. I expected Tracy to be bitterly disappointed and rake me over the coals. After the party, but she was so pleased just to be with me on any excuse that she seemed grateful for the few crumbs of attention she had inadvertently received in a public setting. Tracy wore very few clothes around the house at all times. I applied my engineering skills and sold her to Resistor in parallel with the thermistor built into our digital thermostat to control the temperature. The resistance value I chose caused the heating temperature set point to be 5 degrees lower than the display temperature, and the house was cooler than usual. My idea was to encourage her to put on warm clothes. I was partially successful in doing so. Two weeks later, I removed the fixed value resistor, restoring normal accurate operation. At least I tried, five months after it was serviced. She informed me that she was going to have dinner with Cassidy, her best friend, on Saturdays if I didn't mind watching Bobby. I nonchalantly replied that I didn't mind as long as she didn't bring that fool or any of her lovers into the house. My employer sponsored a bowling league, which I decided to join on those Saturday nights when she went out. I had a lot of fun making a complete fool of myself on the lanes, and Bobby was thrilled to get so much attention from the ladies in attendance. It was so much better than sitting at home wondering what Tracy was doing or who she was. One day... I got home later than she did, and she asked where I had been with Bobby. I told the truth. She asked if she could come with me next time, and I again told her honestly that I only leave the house when she does and not sit home alone. My answer really upset her, but again, pleasing Tracy was no longer my concern. She often asked me how we could ever be a loving couple again if I never gave her a chance. She never signed the divorce papers. It was supposed to take a whole year. Six months after the service, Bob Thornton, my attorney, contacted me and informed me that Tracy's attorney had successfully argued for ten mandatory marriage counseling sessions, two a week. I had to attend them and couldn't just sit and be silent for the entire session. I had to answer every question the counselor asked me. I asked her if I could repeat the same simple short sentence for every question. B said she didn't care what I said as long as I said something relevant to our marriage. I thanked her and hung up. Of course, Tracy's lawyer made sure the marriage counselor was the kind of person who favors the wife and readily vilifies the husband. I didn't care what the therapist thought of me as long as I followed the letter of the law to every question and statement from Tracy and the therapist. I replied, I don't want to stay married to a promiscuous woman. Not a few minutes later. They were both frustrated and angry with me. But while my repeated remark was terse, it also applied to our marriage. I endured the barrage of verbal abuse hurled at me by both women with a smile on my face. I did not raise my voice, call anyone names, or use vulgar language. After the fifth unsuccessful session, the therapist canceled the remaining sessions, citing UN productivity and waste of time. The remaining months passed without change. I continued to spend every spare minute with Bobby and could tell that he felt that special bond I had worked so hard to create. Four days before the divorce hearing date, Tracy moved out of the house and took Bobby with her. I was also served with a restraining order to stay away from both of them until the court date. Subsequently, B contacted me with two scoops. I tried to warn you, Brian. She claims that on three separate occasions you coerced her. She didn't report it at the time of the events because she was hoping for reconciliation, saying it was a price she was willing to pay to keep her child in a two-parent household. However, according to her, the last time you demanded, she felt ill. Then you allegedly forced her. Hospital documents submitted by her attorney show several bruises as evidence. She has countersued for full custody, allowing you only infrequent visits under CPS supervision. I'm afraid she's got you stumped. Is any of what she claims to be? You know me much better than that. Not one word is true. Not one word. Okay. I just needed to hear it from you. 
I will fight for you to the end. But I have little hope of overcoming her accusations without hard evidence to back up your denials. B. Has she provided all the necessary information that you indicated would be required to investigate her allegations? Yes, she has. I have the details in a folder in my office. Can you email me the information her attorney has provided? Sure, for what it's worth. Remember, you cannot call her, email her, text her, or contact her or your son in any way until I tell you otherwise. Do you understand nothing? If she calls you and you hear her voice, don't say a word. Just hang up immediately. Understood, she ordered. Got it? I repeated two days later, walking into the house after work. I was shocked to see Tracy sitting at the kitchen table. Her car was nowhere to be seen. Perhaps she had gone with someone else. She was waiting for me. I had no idea why. My first impulse was to run away so as not to violate the restraining order. But she called out loudly before I could get out the door. Brian, turn around and listen to me if you want to see Bobby again. She definitely had my attention. However, trying not to talk to her, I just stared at her face and kept my distance. Well, you don't have to say a word. Just listen. I remained calm and didn't make any gestures that could be construed as aggressive or confrontational. First hand me your cell phone so I can turn it off. I placed it on the kitchen table. She picked it up and turned it off to make sure there was no recording. I tried my best to talk you down, but you were so stubborn I had to resort to desperate measures. How does it feel to have the shoe on the other foot? It's not very pleasant, is it? I'm sorry, Brian, but you left me no choice. I had to claim we had love, which you demanded to turn back the clock. But Elliot convinced me I needed a backup plan in case your lawyer was convincing enough to object. So I made up a story about you hitting me in anger. We both know you never touched me. I've already told you that you would never hit me in a million years. And I still believe that, even here and now. But I needed to make sure I got full custody of our son, leaving you with only crumbs of time to spend with our baby. It pains me to be so cruel to you, Brian but it puts me in a unique position to negotiate with you. Tracy cleared her throat and continued, If you cancel the divorce, make it go away, and voluntarily agreed to us joining our group of friends as they have generously offered, then I will lift the restraining order, move in with you, and we can resume our happily married life. Bobby would not be born into a single-parent family. He would be raised by both parents living happily under the same roof. Think about it, Brian. What's not to like? I promise you'll get used to it quickly. I'd love to show you the new tricks I've already learned right here and now, if you want. Perhaps that would be too soon. What do you say, Brian? Why don't you get off your high horse and live with me in the real world for a change? I swear you'll have a good time. I looked her straight in the eye. I let her know I was seriously considering her offer. So if I go with you and your friends, are you saying you won't limit my access to Bobby in any way? Why on earth would I come between a loving father and his son? You know as well as I do that the kid loves you more than he loves me. He asks for you all the time, and it breaks my heart to tear him away from you. Just say yes, Brian. Just say yes, and all our problems will go away, she encouraged. First I lost you, then my son. My life is unbearable. I miss Bobby madly. I want to be with him so badly I cried. One word from you will fix everything, Brian. And everything will be restored, she assured me. Give me time to think things through. I need to do some mental gymnastics to figure out how to share you with other men. I just need time, okay? Okay, baby. I've got you figured out. You always analyze everything with your engineering mind. We're going before a judge in two days. I need to hear from you by tomorrow. Just text me one word. Yes. So I know you agree, and I'll make it right again. But if I don't hear from you before the hearing... I will punish you for the rest of your life. Your son will grow up hating you. I will take care of that. And you will pay me for it. Please don't make me do this to you, for Bobby's sake. Okay, honey. Do the right thing for him. That jerk hit me where it hurt the most. My son. Nothing else in the world means as much to me as this little boy. I'll answer as soon as I can. For now, please leave, I insisted. She walked past me with a smirk on her face. She knew she had me by the balls. I held my breath until I heard the door close. Looking out the window, I saw a shiny Lexus pull up quickly next to her. The driver, of course, was Butthole Elliot Franklin. 
he must have a huge boner for her to go to such lengths to accept her into his group. I had a lot to think about. B informed me that my presence at the divorce hearing was not required. My presence wouldn't change the outcome, but I wanted to be there. As I left the men's room to head to the courtroom, Tracy appeared out of nowhere and hissed, You had your chance, you stupid moron. I'll tell you the pieces in there. Your son will never know your name and will grow up calling another man father. I will marry a real man who is not so insecure, who trusts and believes in me and our marriage, who is willing and open to new experiences. Unlike you. Then she spat in my face and hurried away, escorted away by the stares of the onlookers, who wondered what heinous crime I had committed against such a beautiful woman. I took a handkerchief and wiped my face, entering the courtroom and taking a seat in the back. I waited my turn, hoping that my lawyer was at least half as good as her reputation. I had a lot on my plate for today while I waited my turn. It was interesting to hear about some of the crazy divorce cases. I noticed that those who represented themselves really had fools as clients. Our case wasn't heard until 1 p.m., which made for a long day. Tracy was called to testify first, and she had filed a restraining order and made accusations against me for mistreating her. The divorce was a minor issue. I listened intently as she recounted everything I was accused of, including dates, times, and specific locations of the alleged assaults. This was her chance to get custody, child support, alimony, child support, and maybe even jail time. Because, oddly enough, the prosecutor had yet to file formal charges against me. I said nothing as she tearfully recounted her horrific attacks on me. My attorneys silently drew images of flowers in the margins of the notes presented to her. Tracy's lawyer skillfully wove a coherent picture of my violent temper and unsuitability as a parent or guardian of a vulnerable toddler. He explained that Tracy had done her best to reconcile before my latest attack. She claimed that I had falsely accused her of infidelity and that my jealousy had destroyed our marriage and our family. She now agreed that divorce was the best option for her and the child. After the attorney laid out his arguments and rested, he smiled politely, taking her turn with Tracy. I want to clarify and confirm for the record that you are absolutely certain of the dates, times, and locations of the attacks. You accused Mr. Wilson of, can you be wrong, Mrs. Wilson? B looked at him intently. No, ma'am. I understand everything perfectly. My attorney recommended that it was mandatory that I fully document the events should such situations arise, and I wrote everything down on a calendar I kept in a stash. I see. So you swear under oath that the allegations you are making against my client are accurate and true? Yes, ma'am. I wish I could say otherwise, but the truth must be told. Tracy snorted tearfully in response. No further questions, Your Honor. Be informed, the judge. You may step out now. Mrs. Wilson. Thank you. Judge Cora Feldman advised Tracy. She and her attorney seemed stunned that my attorney had not questioned her more thoroughly. Her smirk addressed to me as she got up to leave the witness box set at all. She knew it was a win-win. Even my lawyer hadn't challenged any of her statements. She was ready to fulfill her promise to me to turn my son against me. I shuddered at the thought. Your Honor, I would like to call Mr. James McMahon to the stand to testify be asked. The judge nodded in agreement, and a plain man with no face took a seat up front. Tracy and her lawyer conferred, and she just shrugged. He was obviously unfamiliar to her. Please state for the record your full name, sir. B asked James Winford McMahon. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. May I call you James? Jim, please call me Jim. Of course. Thank you. Jim, could you tell the court where you work and what the nature of your business is? Yes, ma'am. I own and operate McMahon Investigative and Security Services. Jim, would you please tell the court how you met my client, Mr. Wilson? Yes. He approached me about 14 months ago, concerned about his wife, Mrs. Tracy Wilson. He suspected her of infidelity, but had no proof. We offer private investigative services to confirm or disprove such suspicions, and he immediately utilized our services. I see. And what did you discover during your surveillance of Mrs. Wilson, Jim? We were able to gather evidence of her infidelity and provided him with three photographs of her in bed with another man. Were the photographs you provided him with the only existing copies of her dating? 
No, ma'am. We saw all photos and videos in secure cloud storage. We are well aware of the need for chain of evidence and are fully licensed agents respected in this and several other circuit courts. We have all of the originals. Mr. Wilson has only been provided with copies. And do you have other copies of these same images, sir? Yes, we do. Right here. I can confirm that they are copies of the uncorrupted originals. Thank you. Jim. Your Honor, if it pleases the court, we would like to admit into evidence these three copies of the original photographs taken by McMahon Investigative Services. The judge accepted the photos, reviewed them, nodded, and handed them to the bailiff for processing. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Jim, is that the end of your association with Mr. Wilson? No, ma'am. He was concerned that her affair with an unknown gentleman might be an ongoing affair, and asked me for guidance on how to determine if it was an ongoing affair. I recommended that Mr. Wilson install hidden miniature surveillance cameras and microphones throughout the house that could be monitored at all times. Such devices could record phone calls, secret meetings, and graphic images of infidelity. And Mr. Wilson hired your firm to do this for him? Yes, ma'am. We installed the equipment the very next day while Mr. and Mrs. Wilson were at work. Objection, Your Honor. Attorney Tracy protested. I see where this is going. And before this case goes any further, I ask that you declare inadmissible all evidence obtained through those despicable hidden cameras. Mr. Wilson could have easily edited or altered any of those recordings to make the circumstances play out the way he wanted and smear my client. That is unconscionable. Judge Cora Feldman heard the objection and looked at me. Before. I rule on your objection, Counselor. I'd like to find out if there are grounds for it. Attorney Thornton, thank you, Your Honor. Jim, could you explain to the court the nature and type of surveillance system you installed in Mr. Wilson's home? At his request? Of course. All of the cameras transmit data wirelessly to a laptop computer hidden in a subfloor under the house. The laptop is connected to a wired Ethernet hub that continuously streams all collected data to our secure cloud servers. Mr. Wilson does not have access to the raw records. The laptop does not store any local records or files other than the web address to which streaming content is sent and stored. The only way for Mr. Wilson or anyone else to access these files is to contact my firm. I strongly recommended this option to him to ensure that the chain of evidence is constantly monitored. Of course, we provide Mr. Wilson with information that we believe is useful to him and inform him of the circumstances. After reviewing the records, all of Mr. Wilson's involvement with the system is limited to the monthly replacement of the batteries in the camera transmitters. Judge Feldman smiled at Jim and nodded. I've seen you in my courtroom before, Mr. McMahon. Your firm has an excellent reputation. The objection is overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Be cheered. Jim, you heard the testimony of Tracy Wilson accusing my client of assault. She held out a piece of paper to him. Here are the dates and times of the alleged assaults, as portrayed by Tracy Wilson. In your opinion, Jim, do you think her accusations have any merit? No, ma'am. They don't. What makes you so sure, Jim? When your office provided us with those specific dates, times, and locations, my staff went back and reviewed the archival recordings made on those dates and at those locations at Mr. Wilson's home. In all cases, the recordings show a fairly quiet home where Mr. Wilson is happily playing with his son and Tracy Wilson is alone in another room of the house. There was peace and quiet in the Wilson home at the time of the alleged assaults. There were no incidents of violence recorded on the video footage. Tracy and her attorneys seemed interested in the stains on the floor. There was no eye contact. Her case was a wreck. Jim, can you offer any additional information regarding the allegations she made against Mr. Wilson? Yes, ma'am. I can. I have here a transcript of a phone call made by Mrs. Wilson the day before she moved in. It's only her version of the conversation, of course. But in it, she clearly says that she hates to see her husband whom she says she loves very much being treated this way, but that someone else beating her up so she could claim it was him. It's quite obvious. She has stated that she is going to use this as leverage against him to convince him to give in to her wishes. Objection, Your Honor. That's hearsay, her attorney grumbled. If need be, 
I can provide the original tapes of her saying all those words in her own voice. But that transcript is a mirror image of the words she said on the phone to someone other than her husband, offered Jim indignantly. Tracy's lawyer sat down and did not object again. He said, Thank you, Jim, for your expert testimony. No further questions, Your Honor, and sat back down. Judge Feldman looked at Attorney Tracy. Would you like to question this witness, Counselor? Defeated, he said. No questions, Your Honor, Judge Feldman ordered. You may leave the room, Mr. McMahon. Thank you. After my private investigator took his seat, the judge continued, I see what's going on here. An innocent man is being accused of crimes, that it is obvious to the court that he did not commit, in an attempt to sway the court toward full custody of the mother's child. In doing so, Mrs. Wilson perjure herself. Perjury is a third-degree felony and can result in up to 36 months in prison. The transcript of this hearing will be forwarded to the district attorney for possible prosecution. It is my hope that he will press charges against you, Mrs. Wilson. I hereby grant full custody of the child, Bobby Wilson, to his father, Brian Wilson. Tracy Wilson will have visitation rights at Mr. Wilson's discretion. Mr. Wilson, I urge you to be generous with visitation. Your child needs to spend time with his mother. I nodded to the judge in agreement. She continued, As for child support, I am inclined to award it, given how ruthlessly Mrs. Wilson has treated her husband. But I am not without compassion. Alimony, in the amount of $1,000 per month, payable on the first of each month, is awarded to Tracy Wilson for a period of three and a half years, or 42 months. Each of you will keep your automobiles. The checking and savings accounts will be divided equally between the spouses based on the balances in the accounts. As of the date the divorce petition is filed, each party will retain their retirement accounts because Mr. Wilson will have primary custody of the child. The court will not award child support. Mr. Wilson, as custodial parent, I grant you the right to make decisions regarding your current residence. Do you want to stay there or move? I stood up. Your Honor, I have no desire to live there any longer than necessary. Tracy can continue to rent the house if she wants. In any case, I'm moving out. Very well, Mr. Wilson. The lease on the present residence will be left to Mrs. Wilson. Mrs. Wilson. Tracy staggered to her feet and rose to her feet. You have a maximum of eight hours to return the child to Mr. Wilson. If you refuse to comply, you will be held in contempt of court. Is that understood? Yes, Your Honor, she said tearfully. Good. The judge has allowed it. I suggest you take appropriate action before you leave this building today. All restraining orders are lifted, and I grant the petition for divorce in Wilson v. Wilson. You should both receive divorce decrees within thirty days. Tracy cried with despair as she realized she had lost her family. She turned to me to comply with the judge's order. If you don't mind, Brian, I'll bring Bobby to your house tonight after dinner. I'd like to be with him for a few more hours before I turn him over to the judge. That won't be necessary, Tracy. I've just been waiting to see how this trial ends. I've already got my eye on a new apartment, and I'll have some friends help me move there as soon as I get out of here. I held out a piece of paper to her. Here's the address of my furnished apartment. I'm only taking Bobby's stuff. My personal belongings and tools. All the furniture you can keep. Bring Bobby to this address tomorrow at noon. I should be settled in by then. She nodded sadly at me. If anything, I'm sorry. Very sorry. This is not the outcome I envisioned. Well, since life with me was so boring and mundane... From now on, you can have the interesting and fulfilling love life you've been striving for without me. Good luck with your next open marriage, I stated sarcastically. She didn't say anything back. Brian, I want to thank you. For what? For not going after Elliot and Gail Franklin. They really are wonderful people. Too bad you'll never get to know them like I did, she said gratefully. No problem. I have absolutely no interest in Elliot or Gail Franklin as far as I'm concerned. They don't exist to me at all. No, neither Elliot nor Gale. But I can tell you who I'm interested in doing business with, the company you work for. I found out from HR that your company has a very strict non-brotherhood policy because so many women work there, and they want to protect them from predators. I will be suing your company tomorrow 
claiming that blatant violations of their policy caused the destruction of my marriage, and almost cost me my son. Ronald Hensley will be named as the primary culprit. Apparently, he slept with a dozen female employees in violation of company policy. You may have heard of him. He's your manager. Tracy stood puzzled, opening and closing her mouth like a fish in water. I continued. As it turns out, Ronald has a lovely wife, Lydia, and two elementary school-aged children. I don't know if she knows about his antics with other women, but don't worry. I'll make sure she knows everything, including Rita, Consuela, the woman he claims he's been married to for so long, and his greatest love on earth. You may know her as Gail, but why? Why did you do it? His wife and children don't deserve to be destroyed like this, she pleaded. Why? He destroyed my marriage. Why shouldn't I destroy it? He almost robbed me of my son. Why shouldn't his children know the truth? Even now, to this day, you defend and protect him. How enlightening. If you stick around a while longer, Tracy, you might be able to get the man of your dreams. Your extraordinary lover. Something tells me he could be divorced within a year or less. The only downside to a lover is that he, too, could be unemployed very soon. Just like all your other call center girlfriends, it seems that their silence when they don't condemn Ronald's disgusting behavior also violates company policy. You want us all fired? But how am I going to support myself now? She objected. Oh, don't worry. Your job is safe. I promised your company that I wouldn't publicize this, as long as they kept you on staff to think you could eventually start your own group of whores. I can only imagine how wonderful your life will be when I'm no longer in your way. Once you explain to them how lasciviousness has strengthened our marriage, I'm sure the ladies will be bursting with desires to join you. You may have a hard time hiring another manager. Perhaps one of the husbands will take on a leadership role. Just imagine all the exciting new possibilities, enthused I. But why are you protecting my job and firing everyone else? She babbled for one reason and one reason only. Tracy. I agree with the judge that Bobby needs a mother in his life. It's not exactly a dream job, and it doesn't pay very much, but it's enough so you can live without having to come to me for money. One day, when he asks me how I treated you in the divorce, I want to be able to honestly say I was fair. If you tell him otherwise, I'll show him the proof. Neither Tracy nor her friends knew that I had already known her lover's real name from day one. My private investigator does an excellent job and is worth every cent he charges me. An engineer always approaches a problem from a position of knowledge. If we don't have the answer, find someone who does. That's exactly what we do. Be my shark of a lawyer. Sued Tracy's call center for a million and a half and settled for a tidy sum, 250000 she kept. And the rest went to me. The day I received my paycheck, I wrote Tracy a check for $42,000 in a lump sum. My child support obligations were paid in full by her own company, and there was still a lot left over. Now, I could build my dream home. Word spread quickly through the workplace. Many single ladies where I work looked at me as potential prey. But after just getting off this roller coaster, I think I'm going to focus on Bobby for a while before I get involved in dating again. Free at last. <laughs>